Hi, my name is Desiree Akhavan. I am a filmmaker from New York City, and I made a film called Appropriate Behavior, which is screening right now at the Exposed Queer Film Festival. Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. That's the official title. Uh, the film is a romantic comedy, a gay Annie Hall is how I've pitched it for the past few years, about a woman who is trying to win back her ex-girlfriend while come out as bisexual to her Iranian-American family. Your movie premiered in the Sundance Film Festival. How was it? It was a really great experience. I'm so glad it wasn't a bad experience. People always ask me, what was that like? And if it were bad, I, I don't know what if I'd have to lie. It actually was fantastic. Uh, but what would you tell us if it was a bad experience? I'm trying to wonder. I don't know. I don't know. What would be like, because like, how would you feel if I was like, it was a bad experience? And you'd be, then the whole interview would have to be about what a bad time I had at Sundance. I would actually feel honored because I would know you're not lying to me. Exactly. <laughs> no, it was actually really fun. But I went in with good expectations. Like I, I, I went to my therapist beforehand and she said, what are your expectations? And I said, you know, I want to watch people watch my film. So I want to watch it with an audience because I hadn't before. It, we just finished um, doing the sound mix days before our world premiere. I said I want to dance at a party, like I want to dance hard. Um, what else? Oh, I really wanted to meet Marjan Satrapi, mm -hmm. the Iranian filmmaker. And I did all three. Well, that's I, very good. I did all three things and it was so much fun. I had such a good time. But those are my goals and I achieved them. And I think if you make your goals things that are out of your control, like I want to make a huge sale, I want to, you know, uh, move my career in XYZ way. Uh, it's gonna hurt you at the end, mm. but I had a good time. Well, that's fabulous. And how did the audience react to your movie? How were the Q and A's? Everything felt fantastic. I think people, most people, are um, too uncomfortable to be rude to your face. So people were lovely. The Q and A's were really fun. Iranians are not afraid to be mean to your face. <laughs> I have to say, um, all the the exclusively the the. All the negative interactions I've had with audiences have been with Iranians. But that said, not all my interactions with Iranians have been negative. But anytime someone looked me in the face and said, like, I don't like this, it was an Iranian. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> white people will wait until your back is turned. <laughs> that's not very nice <laughs> either. But... Yeah, no judgment here. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just pointing out facts. All right. Um, well, your movie. You're playing the main role in your movie, you're playing the lead role, you were directing the movie. How much of yourself is actually this movie? So I would say the film's not autobiographical, but it's all myself in the way that any filmmaker who makes a movie, uh, their blood is in it. It's them. It's their point of view of the world. And I'm talking any film. I'm talking a Spielberg film or a bullshit action movie. That is that person's point of view of the world and how they think it is through their eyes. The film's not autobiographical. The things in the film didn't happen. I didn't um, ever try to win back an ex-girlfriend. I didn't come out to my family in the way that the character does. But when I was writing it, I wanted to find a way to fictionalize the experience I had had of coming out to my parents and getting my heart broken. So it was sort of a choose your own adventure. And the character herself is far more entitled and bratty and obnoxious, hopefully, than I am. But I wanted a comedy. I wanted a character that we could enjoy poking fun at. And it was kind of a commentary on characteristics you only expect entitled white straight people to, to have. Every time I see a queer woman or a woman of color in a movie, she's playing a violin and telling her sad story, and she's a victim. And I didn't want to be a victim. I wanted to be how I felt in life, which was just as entitled as anyone else to have joy. Mm. So it was a very conscious approach to show a not white queer person in the movie. It's not that it's conscious, it's that that's my point of view of the world. I don't know what it's like to be a white straight person. So this is my perspective. And it's not an agenda like, here, let me cram something specific down your throat, or let me paint a picture of all women of color. It's just, this is me. It's a very personal point of view. Mm. You already said that the movie contains a lot of yourself, yeah. even though it's not autobiographical. Would you say that it is sort of an exhibitionistic piece of art? No. 
Why not? I don't know. It's hard because how would you define exhibitionism within art? Mm, I don't know, but I have the f well. I'm asking because I have the feeling that even though it's not autobiographical, you expose a lot of yourself. I guess, but the fact that I'm at the helm of it feels like it's not exposing. Mm -hmm. The very nature of the fact that I wrote and directed and starred in this film means that ne means that I am the curator, that I'm drawing your eye where I want your eye to go. That. And the very nature of that is that I'm not exposed because exposure to me implies it implies a lack of control, perhaps. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong and it's a matter of semantics, but I don't ever feel exposed with this film. The things that are sacred to me are sacred and I don't talk about them publicly. The things in this film to me aren't sacred, they're human rights. Mm -hmm. When you already said that you are drawing, that you are in control of where you want to go, what you're showing, yeah. and you're showing Brooklyn. Yeah. Why did you choose for this, well, this society, those people in Brooklyn? Because that's mine. It's my society, it's my people, it's where I, I didn't grow up in Brooklyn, but I grew up in the New York area. And I've been moving around New York my entire life. And it was what I knew. I wrote my backyard. I, I wrote the world as I saw it. So it wasn't a choice. That's the thing about the film, is that none of it was, uh, the subject matter was this idea of, ooh, I have to portray this world. It was, what do I know? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting to hear because, <clears throat> well, sometimes I had the feeling that the movie was very centered mm -hmm. in Brooklyn and that, well, th this is not meant in a negative way, but I had the feeling that it was, um, well, basically looking at yourself all the time, but not looking to the outside. Yeah. Is, would you say it is that way? I think that if you are successful in looking at yourself, you have the power to say something incredibly universal about the world. Mm -hmm. So I do think the film looks outwards, but I think it's in a tricky way. Mm -hmm. Like I think that by being so self-involved and uh, so navel-gazing, that actually it's saying something, saying more universal things. Um, and I actually know from people who've spoken to me that it has spoken to people who have stories that are so different from my own. It's specificity that I care about. It's not universal, uh, obvious truths that everyone knows to be factually correct. I don't, this film isn't about representing the entire world or the entire Brooklyn community. It's about one specific story. Mm -hmm. And it's very self-reflected yes. in that sense. Yeah. Your main character, Shireen, mm. would you say that she is a happy person? Because that was something I was thinking about a lot while watching the movie, because in a way she seemed very happy, but at the same time she always had this aura of, well, not happiness, something else, I don't know, melancholy maybe. Yeah, yeah. I do think she's a happy person. I think that and this is the thing I see in myself that I wanted to put in the character, which is that her circumstances are upsetting her and that she's going through a momentary cloud of sadness because of a breakup and because of her circumstances, but that she always wants to choose fun mm. and choose joy. And I like that quality in people. And I like that in myself, that even when you're feeling your shittiest, um, you're going to keep chasing adventure and chasing experience and connecting to other people. Mm. And the relationship between Shireen and her ex-girlfriend, well, I sometimes, or in the beginning, especially had the feeling that it was, well, not a classical one based on, oh, we meet and we fall in love with, with each other, but rather, oh, we both don't have someone else and we both don't like people, sort of. And that was the connecting thing between them. Yeah. Um, do you think that is something, well, is that what their relationship was based on or was that just the initial point? And do you think that relationships can be based on such a thing? Relationships can be based on anything. I don't fucking know what a relationship should be based on. For this couple in my brain, I mean, I think obviously I shouldn't be saying anything in that it's, anybody's interpretation is accurate. If you watch a film, you think something happened, you're correct. It's not for the director to tell you this is the truth or this is not the truth. It's, I have intentions, but you interpret it however you want to interpret it. And 
that's the joy of being an audience member. Um, I always thought that they were very sexually connected and they were connected through mutual negativity, which I like. I think that some that's cool. When I hate the same things as other people, that is, a lot of my friendships have been based on that and have been beautiful friendships. And I can't judge whether or not a romantic relationship could survive on that basis alone. Uh, but yeah, I did think that was unique. I mean, movies, I'm constantly seeing people being like, you know, you love the Beatles, I love the Beatles. And it's like, of course, every asshole loves the Beatles. But do you hate the same things I do? Um, that to me is very specific. Uh, yeah, but I don't know if they could survive. And I also felt like they had a sexual connection that couldn't uh, sustain itself. Mm -hmm. And Shireen's coming out to her parents, I found quite interesting, well, to her mother and her brother. Mm -hmm. um, I, I found the reaction of the mother very interesting, that she was just completely denying it. Like, she didn't hear it and it's not existing. Is that something that you heard about that happened to people you know? Is that something very common in Iranian families? Or why, why is it in the movie like this? It was, I chose to show the coming out scene in the way that I did in that because I had never seen a coming out scene that reflected the subtlety of the experience of coming out as I knew it and a lot of people I know knew it. In that usually it's fireworks, that people are crying and there's, there's all this emotion and all this... Um, catharsis one way or another but a lot of people that I know and for myself too that it was a series of conversations that they kept having to come out and I'm really interested in my work to explore the gray area to explore subtle moments when it comes to sex when it comes to love when it comes to pain uh, and to family I don't think things are black and white. I don't think one conversation changes in every example. I mean, there are examples of it happening, but in movies that I love, it's when you know that it's the beginning of a larger conversation. And it was important to me not to, to, to stage an experience I already knew of coming out, but to embody a larger point which is that no one wants to have this conversation, that you close one eye when you, my father always said this to me, he said to make a friend, you open your eyes to someone's good qualities, and then to keep a friend, you close one of your eyes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very much what people do, that they close their eyes to the truth of people's ugly behavior, ugly as they <coughs> see ugly. And that's what this family would have done that they, they would have kept their head down and said, nope, didn't hear anything, keep moving. Mm -hmm. And kept shoving it under the ground, shoving under the ground until the person who's struggling and wanting to be honest explodes. Mm -hmm. But, well, it is also a topic in the movie, homosexuality in Iran is forbidden and so forth. How is it among people, Iranians, that are not living in the country? Is that a problem as yeah. well? Yeah. It's a huge problem. I mean, before this screening, an Iranian just came, guy just came up to me and said he wasn't out to his parents. When I came out of the closet, I did not know of one gay person in the Iranian community. Not famous, not family, not a, a, a anecdote, literally not one person. It was like saying, I'm coming out as like, hey, I'm Mickey Mouse, like I'm a unicorn. It, it's, it's, you're, a fiction, you're saying you're something fictional that doesn't exist in your world. Mm. It was the most isolating, lonely, strange experience because even with other gay people, I wasn't able, at least their parents had an idea of who Ellen DeGeneres was. Like in the Iranian community, it didn't exist. And at the same time, it's like especially weird coming out as bisexual because there's this hope that it's like, well, if you could make the choice to be with a man, why would you choose to be with a woman? Yeah, I could go on about this for a long time. <laughs> it's actually very interesting, I think. Um, what, what I wonder is, doesn't that put you in a very exposed position now after this movie? In what respect? Um, in respect to your family, Possibly uh, Iranian community contacts your family have with other Iranians that are living in the USA. What are they going to say? I don't know. I have no clue. I don't... 
you're only as vulnerable as, as you see yourself. I don't feel exposed because I, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm not ashamed of who I am or my behavior. And that's what I said to my family when I started making work, when I started making queer cinema. And they had to follow suit. I mean, it wasn't fair. It was a choice I made that they had to live with the consequences of. And they've been lovely, like very supportive, and they've adjusted. Um, I don't feel exposed, because to me, exposure implies guilt. A murderer is exposed. A rapist is exposed. I'm gay. Like, what am I exposing here? I, I love people. I make films. Like, what is there to be exposed? Mm. Well, you were already talking about your, you making queer films. Mm -hmm. Are you happy with the situation of queer movies and how queer people are depicted in movies currently? No, I'm not happy with the current situation of queer films, but I'm not happy with a lot of situations and I think it's changing and growing. I mean, Carol just premiered at Cannes and it's very exciting. I think it's a moment in history when a female-driven uh, lesbian love story is premiering at that level in competition at Cannes starring movie stars. It's hard because queer cinema is the minute you make a gay storyline, your movie is, for the most part, automatically shifted to the ghetto of gay movies. You're not entitled to the same distributors, to the same marketplace, to the same respect, uh, the same audiences. And I think that's going to change the more talented filmmakers label themselves as queer filmmakers. Mm. But you would say at the moment it, it, it is still labeled in a ghetto. For the most part, yeah. Okay. Well, you've just been to come. You yeah. premiered at the Sundance, and now you're here at the Exposed Queer Film Festival. What do you expect from the screening here? Do you expect it to be different from, from Sundance? I don't know. I actually have a lot of, I'm very curious. I mean, yeah, of course, different from Sundance. This is a much gayer audience. I, I hope they like the film. I hope it's, it's one of the gayer audiences I've had. I've been to other queer film festivals, but there's something about Berlin that feels far more um, open-minded and experimental. And I hope the film doesn't disappoint them. I hope it's not too mainstream for them, to be honest. All right, well, then I wish you a very good screening <laughs> and a lot of fun at the Q&A. Thank you. And thank you very much for the interview. Thank you.